What is going on, everybody? It's the Fonz and we're here for Unscripted number 97 for your December 1st, 2019. We're with 30 days left in the year. We're getting so close to the end of the year. By the end of this year, we will have ourselves a couple of best of 2019s from the best takeover, the best WWE pay per view, the best AEW pay per view, the best match of the year, the wrestler of the year, and all that stuff. I'm hoping to do all that towards the end of the year. So look for that in the final week of the final episode. Episode number 100 is not going to be news for Raw, SmackDown, NXT, AEW, or anything. It's going to be our best of the year that is coming to you December 29th. Make sure to check that out. We will have it all ready for you. Episode 100 later this year. As we usually do for this episode, as these episodes recently, Raw, AEW, SmackDown, and NXT, um, what, we, what I've taken away from those, we go over what I want to talk about, and then we talk a little bit about the ratings of the week and a couple news stuff headlines I get here and there. Another disclaimer on the ratings for this week as AEW and NXT were unfortunately the day before Thanksgiving, so those ratings are not in. I do have the preliminary, uh, the prelims for SmackDown and SmackDown's ratings from last week, so we will also go over that. But as we do, let's start off with our, uh, for, uh, my thoughts on Monday Night Raw and things coming out of it. Right off the start of the show, we had Seth Rollins call a town hall meeting. Most, if not all, of the talent for Monday Night Raw was around the ring. Seth was in the ring, being as heel as Seth Rollins could be. Heading into Monday Night Raw's team, like Team Raw, because Team Raw got shellacked the night before at Survivor Series. Other than only the Viking Raiders picking up a win. He took it to Rey Mysterio saying you couldn't get the job done. You out of every like I beat the beast twice this year and you couldn't do a damn thing with your stupid son in the in a lead pipe. He called Randy Orton the link weak link. He called he could he questioned Charlotte Flair's um Flair Flairdom. Just being as heel as he could be, even though he was still trying to be a babyface. Seth Rollins, just cracking under pressure. Everything that we said on Seth Rollins during the last six or so months since he became the Universal Champion at WrestleMania and just started cracking under the pressure, they have taken that and made it into what Seth Rollins is on main TV. So he's there insulting everybody and, and everyone said, you know what, I'm not listening to this joke anymore, I'm leaving. So everyone leaves except for one Kevin Owens. He invites Kevin Owens into the ring, calls him um, a lazy, good for nothing, what has he done since he's been here, does nothing while I do everything, and then he gets, then Kevin Owens stuns him, setting up the main event, which looks like that's going to be a feud going forward. However, later on in the show, Kevin Owens gets a um, cut a promo. Cuts the best promo of the week. Saying that, pretty much saying, I know who I have been since day one, since I laced up a pair of wrestling boots. I'm Kevin Owens, I will always be Kevin Owens, I'm good with that. You, however, Seth, you have been trying to become something that you are not. You're trying to do what you can to make this company happy, and just becoming a shell of your former self, and then it turns you into a whiny, prick, a whiny um, ego egotistical prick. Everything we have said about Seth Rollins. The only thing he didn't say was a clown, which is what we've always, what some of us in the community have called him Rollins because he's acting like a fucking clown. So, absolutely great promo from Kevin Owens. Another big thing coming out of this week's Raw was AOP. AOP for months have been talking about pain being the, um, being gospel, pain. Pleasure out of pain, just causing a lot of pain, writing the book next chapter in the book of pain. So they were in the town hall meeting and Seth Rollins tore into them. They're like, you guys weren't even at Survivor Series last night, but we could have used you. You guys have been talking about um, delivering pain, so where were you? We didn't need you last night, we don't need you tonight, get out of here. So AOP made their in-ring return, uh, which was fine. They took on Zack Ryder and Kurt Hawkins. Unfortunately, that means that AOP, along with, Zach, uh, along with the Viking Raiders, are going to be taking on jobbers for the next um, team weeks and team months. Hopefully, this will lead to AOP versus the Viking Raiders. I mean, it has to. So it has to be that feud between the two big hoss tag teams of AOP, the Officers of Pain, 
and the Viking Age. You just, it just makes sense. Not having them go Clash right now makes sense too because you just don't want to throw that away. People complaining about the Vi uh, AOP like I was just doing and having them go up against jobbers like Kurt Hawkins and Zack Ryder or not no-name jobbers. But if they had the Viking Raiders come, if they came out and attacked the Viking Raiders during a Viking Raiders match and set up a match for a week or two from now, people would sit there and bitch, moan, and complain. So all I have to say is it sucks that the WWE's tag team division is this poor, this piss poor, but I guess we have to take this overseeing the Viking Raiders and the AOP week in and week out, diminishing anything that these two teams could do against each other. And finally, the main event was Seth Rollins versus Kevin Owens. This looks like to be our main feud on the main roster because Brock Lesnar is not going to be seen anywhere near Monday Night Raw until January. I'd say about midway through January, Brock Lesnar will make his return because he's going to be defending his title at Royal Rumble. He's going to hold that title to WrestleMania, and will it be Seth Rollins again? I hope the hell not. That's the way that having Seth Rollins portrayed. I don't think Seth Rollins should be in that title picture. But who would beat Brock Lesnar? I would say Drew McIntyre would be my pick on that, but WWE doesn't know what to do with him. Owens and Rollins look to be the few moving forward as they had themselves a pretty interest, a pretty good uh, match going on until all of a sudden, for whatever reason, Aiken and Mazar come down, out of, they got out of their resting tight um, pants, put on the nice suits again, came down, beat the hell out of Kevin Owens because Kevin Owens struck one of them first. They beat the hell out of him. They turn to look like they're going to attack Seth Rollins, and then they just exit the ring to a chorus of boos. Is this going to lead... Now, see, I think this is a red handing, because I, I equate this to what a, a, a Impact Wrestling did back with the Aces and Ace, when Aces and Ace first came out, and Rob Bobby Roode came out and accused James, James Storm of being the leader of the Aces and Ace, and every time... Um, the Aces and Ace would come out and attack somebody for a couple weeks. James Storm would run down to make a save, and a the Aces and Ace would leave. So I feel like this is a red herring for somebody else to be the one pulling the strings of the AOP. They're gonna, it's going to bring Seth Rollins further and further down into the area of madness because everyone's going to believe that the that he's calling the shots on the AOP, and then when. It looks like everyone, it looks like, oh, and like, you're going to have like the announcement be like, see, see, it's been Seth Rollins this whole time, and then bam, curveball. They attack Seth Rollins and take him out. Who's going to be the one behind the AOP? I don't know. I probably don't want to know because that's going to be a disappointment. Watch it be Lindsay, watch it be um, Lindsay Dorado, or watch it be one of the B team or something like that, which would be a massive disappointment. Also, another thing that happened on Monday Night Raw before I forget, Rey Mysterio is your United States Champion again. Why is Rey Mysterio United States Champion when he really didn't need to win it? Why did WWE go from... Like, anybody realizes that Humberto Carrillo had about three, four weeks as a guy that Vince McMahon was going to push. And if you didn't realize by Monday... And Berto Carrillo, as a top guy, is done. He is not going to be your next Rey Mysterio. He's not going to be your next mid-guard guy who's going to take the, the, the mid-card flag and run with it for a while, maybe eventually becoming a, a WWE champion in about a year, year, year or two from now. He is done. He is in the done. He is done. Vince McMahon has this, like, it's clear that Vince McMahon has this policy. He brings somebody up from NXT or 205 Live, you go, you get behind them for a couple weeks, just like just ask Buddy Murphy. Buddy Murphy, from for three straight weeks, he took Daniel Bryan, he took Roman Reigns to the limit, lost to Roman Reigns. He took, he beat Daniel Bryan in a fantastic match the very next week. Then he lost to Mustafa Ali. Those are three great fucking weeks. Just look at Mustafa Ali. The dude was over. He got, he beat Daniel Bryan in his first singles match. In, w, in the w, in, on the main roster. They brought him over to SmackDown. He was supposed to be in the Elimination Chamber. He was going to have the Kofi Kingston run. He was supposed to be the guy going up against Daniel Bryan on his way to WrestleMania, but an injury stopped that. He comes back. 
and they do nothing with him. Like, just add, like, anybody who still thinks that Vince McMahon is going to push a guy like Humberto Carrillo, look at Buddy Murphy, look at Mustafa Ali, look at um, Cedric, um, sorry, look at Cedric Alexander, look at Andrade. You get three weeks, like two to three weeks. If you don't have a, if you come out and you're just getting nothing, Vince is done with you. Even though Vince should realize that when you had Humberto Carrillo's very first match, very first match on the main roster, on Monday Night Raw, was against your Universal Champion. And there's no way you're going to have Humberto Carrillo win against the Universal Champion. It's, it's just not going to happen. So, so, even though you had Humberto be endorsed by Seth Rollins that night, then you have him go up against AJ Styles the very next week. And if I'm correct, he lost to AJ Styles or did he beat AJ Styles? I'm pretty sure he lost to AJ Styles. Having these guys, like, go out there, they can have fantastic matches, but we as fans know that if you're going out there only to get beat in the end, what is the fucking point? If that's all that WWE is going to do is have Alberto Carrillo go out there against the Universal Champion and lose in spectacular fashion in a hell of a match between the two, we all know that eventually Vince McMahon's not going to care. This isn't AEW where you have Darby Allin go up against Chris Jericho and give you a star-making performance, and we know that, hey, this guy's got a chance, even though he lost to the champ. Or you have Scorpio Sky, and the, like, Scorpio Sky is one of the more open and over guys in the company. He went from being the third member of SCU to being the breakout star in the last month and a half. All from the time that he had to tag, the, all from the time that he replaced um, Christopher Daniels and they won the tag team tournament from that, from the time he replaced Christopher Daniels in that tag match up to the one the tag team tournament to the time he pinned Chris Jericho last week, Scorpio Sky is over. Nobody in WWE is over because you're conditioned that, fans have been conditioned that if they're not winning, they're not worth a damn. So having Humberto Carrillo come out for this match this past Monday only to be destroyed by the OC just tells you and reinforces the fact that he is done. He is not, he'll, he'll be on TV. He will be on TV in a um, supporter, supporter role but he's not going to be in championship contendership. He's not going to be pushed as a megastar. He's done. So they just say, well, basically what WWE's been trying to do, and this is, and I find this hilarious. WWE, since Rey Mysterio first got, was, like, first started getting really injured back in the mid to uh, the early 10s, 2010s, when they, Rey Mysterio seemed to always be getting injured. They tried with Alberto Dario, Sin Cara 1, Sin Cara 2, now Humberto Carrillo, even Kalisto. They've been trying to find the next Rey Mysterio to create a new Rey Mysterio. Here's where I find this funny. They have never created a Rey Mysterio clone or a new Rey Mysterio because they did not create Rey Mysterio. WCW, ECW, and AAA created Rey Mysterio. He was, he fell into their lap, but Rey Mysterio was a fucking star before he came to WWE. Until they realized that they did not, had nothing to do with the popularity of Rey Mysterio, then now they will realize that, hey, we can't even create this shit. So yes, for like the last, I'd say like seven, eight, nine years or so, WWE has been trying to recreate something that wasn't even their creation in the first place. So what do they do? They go back to Rey Mysterio and they give him the United States Championship. I think it's also because Rey Mysterio has an 18th month out clause in his two year contract. And that is coming up mid, uh, beginning of next year. Yes, Rey Mysterio in March could be out. And he can go, to, uh, he can go back to Japan if he wants to go work some of those. He can go to um, Jacksonville and all of the wrestling. He could go to Ring of Honor if he wanted to. He could go to Impact Wrestling. It doesn't matter. They don't want him to do that. They really, really don't want him to do that because that is Rey Mysterio. And he is a major player for anybody. 
Like, having if WWE release a SIM card, that's not going to make a damn difference to anyone. If they release Mike Kanellis, Mike Kanellis is not going to be a big... Uh, Mike Bennett's not going to be a major mover for AEW right off the bat. If they... If they release Luke Harper, Luke Harper might not be... Like, Brody Lee might not be from the beginning, but eventually Brody Lee would be somebody I could see making a difference. It just wouldn't be right away. But yes, Rey Mysterio. If Rey Mysterio was to leave WWE again, and he was to go to an AEW, it, that first night in on that, on their TNT show, if he was to be on that uh, first episode that he's available to, I guarantee that would be they would be in the one point twos. Especially if Rey Mysterio is going up against the Ray Phoenix or Nick Jackson or Pentagon or Matt Jackson or or uh, Jack Evans or Helico or Jungle Boy or Luchasaurus, anybody. Just, and that's another thing. He needs to leave. I mean, hell, Rey Mysterio versus Chris Jericho. Rey Mysterio versus John Moxley. Rey Mysterio versus Darby Allen. Could you imagine all of these these men, these men that fucking Rey Mysterio could go out there and give you a match that actually feels like it means something? Rey Mysterio is a part of his career that he's in WWE again. It just doesn't feel like anything that he's in fucking matters. I mean, yes, at the beginning of the year we had Andrade versus Rey Mysterio 1 and 2 that were fucking fantastic. By the time we got to 3 and 4, it was just like, do we have to see this match again and again and again and again? But, yes, Rey Mysterio is your new United States Champion. Owens and Rollins look to be having a heated feud going into TLC, possibly. AOP make their in-ring return, and Seth Rollins at the beginning of the show, which, by the way, on Monday, on tomorrow, on Monday, Seth Rollins tweeted out on Saturday, or Friday night, I can't remember what time the um, hours, how many hours are from when I actually saw it, it might have been Friday night, he said, I've done a lot of soul searching, I'm looking to, I want to, he pretty much wants to apologize to the entire Raw locker room this coming Monday, should be interesting to see if how this goes. Will he mean it? Will he fall further and further into the, um, into this madness that he has? What will happen? Only time will tell. I'll have the results review for that on Tuesday. Moving over to AEW, we had Chris Jericho's celebration, which when Jericho wants to do a celebration, this guy goes out. All out. He had mascot balloons on um, people. We had a dinosaur, a cow. He had some clowns who had their feet bent the wrong way. It looked kind of fucking creepy. There's so much going on for this thing. He had his dad there with the Rangers jersey on, making fun of the Blackhawks. Which, yeah, you, 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 they would, I'm, I'm sure Ted Irvine needed some other security to get out of the building. He had uh, Justin Roberts getting beat up because he read the thank you and Chris Jericho didn't like his tone. Just so much going on in this thing. You had you had Chris Jericho, goat, the um, goat that Jake Hager had. Now it see it's funny because you had that whole entire sorry thing last week with Jake Hager saying sorry for Chris Jericho every time, and now it just seems like he's gonna talk every chance they got because he had a mic this week and was like, "Hey, this is for you." You know his name? It's Chris Jericho. Uh, the only thing about this entire celebration thing is I think it went a little too long. It just felt like it was going on and on and on, and they just could never get the thing to go away. Long story short, after Justin Roberts gets the hell beat out of him, SCU makes the save, and they took out Soul Train Jones, who used to be Virgil, which WWE seems to own five names that um, Soul Train Jones used to use, but they don't use his original wrestling name, Soul Train Jones. One of the things coming out of this show was the debut. The Butcher, the Blade, and the Bunny. um, Cody Rhodes in this show was going went up against the Jabra, beat him, wanted the wanted MJF to come out and have this little brawl they're going to have. And all of a sudden you see this guy come up with a mask on, a black mask. Apparently, it, it was the Blade, I believe it was. And then another guy comes up, it's the Butcher. These guys beat the hell out of Cody. Apparently, this is a, northwest, a northeastern territory 
a northeastern independent promoting shin from a, a northeast way what these guys to work in the northeast of United States why would you have these guys because this come, they come out to Chicago here and nobody knows who the fuck they are this is just like when the Dark Order um, came out for Double or Nothing and nobody knew who the hell they were. Why the hell would you have the Blade, the Butcher, and the Buddy, who is Allie, who is the Blade's wife, a.k.a. It is Braxton Sutter, who was in Impact Wrestling with his wife, Allie, who has been in, in AEW since the start. But why would you have the Blade and the Butcher, if they're well known in the Northeast area, like, when you guys come to Ohio, and when they come to Ohio or something, you could at least have done it then, where they would probably be more well-known. They came out here, it kind of fell flat, nobody knew who the hell they were. You didn't have a single, you didn't have a reaction that was going to be something worth anything. Why the hell would you do this? Why the hell would you go through with the Blade, the Butcher, and the Bunny on this night? It made absolutely no sense. And... Apparently, Ali's a heel now? Why? What, what was that? I don't know. One of the other things on this show was Jericho vs. Sky in a, tag, in a world title match. The match was fine. The match was going pretty good. The ending sucked. Everyone was banned from ringside. Jake Hager comes running down. SCU comes down to neutralize him. And then... Jericho just gets the walls of Jericho on Scorpio Sky, and he just immediately taps out. His back wasn't really worked on. His legs weren't worked on. Nothing of his lower body was worked on, and yet, usually when you see somebody in the walls of Jericho, you see them, like, trying to move around, because this wasn't the lion timber with his, like, his, his heel or shin in the back of his head. No, this was the wall, this was the walls of Jericho, and Scorpio Sky just tapped out like as fast as he could. It kind of killed. Now, AEW, for like the last two title matches, when they had the tag title match uh, two, weeks, uh, two weeks ago, and they had this title match this week, Excalibur said, if we go past the TV time limit, we will go to YouTube for this match, for the rest of this match. And I'm fine with that. And of course, I did notice, I think it was last week or the week before that, right before AEW came on to TNT that night, they were, sh they were test streaming the AEW Dark logo for a few minutes for whatever reason. It was probably to test to see how fast they could go from TV to um, YouTube if they had to. And both times, well, this time, it just felt like they knew they were coming up on the TV time to end, and they wanted to do the whole thing that came afterwards, so they just killed this match immediately. Just wasn't, if you're going to keep advertising, TV time does not matter because we'll go to YouTube for this 60 minute time limit match. Why the hell are you ending this in such disappointing fashion? Yes, I know, what happened afterwards, I guess would have saved the show, I guess saved the, saved the entire thing because you had John Moxley's music hit, he walks down from where he usually would as the shield, member of the S.H.I.E.L.D. from the crowd and just stares a hole in Chris Jericho. And right before they fade to black, he starts walking down the stairs a little bit more, heading towards the ring, and they fade to black. I know why they, why they ended the match with disappointment because if they're going to shoot that angle and have John Moxley, who earlier in the night was... Opening had an open challenge and said, I'm open to anybody. Who's going to be crazy enough to come after me? Again. If you're going to have that be the way you end the show, why would you only give this match 12 minutes? This absolutely was a dud to end this show. You had the Diamond Battle Royal, the Diamond match, the, di the, di the, di the Diamond match, which apparently is going to be a yearly thing. I'm, not, I'm going to hold them to that. If we come to next year and they don't have another... Diamond Battle Royal to see the winner will face off against MJF for this diamond ring. What's the fucking point? I I really don't care about that diamond ring. I really don't. That's why I didn't add it in this. But yes. Why the hell? If you're going to advertise that you're going... You could go to YouTube. Would you end the match in such a disappointing fashion? Oh yes. The reason you wanted to end it in such a disappointing fashion is because you had John Moxley come down to... 
Sarah Hall into Chris Jericho and you don't want that to be on YouTube, you want that to be on TV. You want the biggest audience that you can get to see that John Moxley is targeting Chris Jericho now. But again, you ended the match in disappointment. NXT. NXT. NXT opens the show with Josiah Williams. He's saying after they, after they went to war, they went to Survivor Series and mopped the floor with Raw and SmackDown. Now it's time to celebrate. The majority of the rosters out there, he's rapping a, 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 a celebration theme and the Undisputed Era comes out. Says, you guys didn't do anything. We did everything. We are the reason for the success of NXT. You guys are on NXT. We are on NXT. Even though you lost at War Games, Kyle Valley and Bobby Fish lost in the tag team triple threat match. Yes, Roderick Strong and Adam Cole won their matches, but that's not saying much. And I'm saying that's not saying that you guys are the only reason. Were you guys on Team NXT for the women? Were you guys on Team NXT for the men? No, because the men in NXT came down to Keith Lee. So, the Monster Chopper, Matt Riddle, and Keith Lee, and Dominic Dijakovic, which was supposed to be the original four men in the elimination in the War Games match. Or in the ring, and they have words back and forth. Chopper says, "Well, Keith Lee and Dyche Kovic could win the tag on um, tag titles. Eventually, it looks like he's teasing that Roderick Strong will take on that Riddle for the tag for the North American Championship. Didn't say that, but implied it, and that he's going back for Goldie, which is fine." And he said, nobody in this undisputed era is standing in my way when out came Finn Balor. He said, he's in his way, and if you want to get to that, you have to go through me, which people are still at this time thinking that maybe Balor is going to eventually join the undisputed era. We would have our answer on that at the end of the night. So that was your main event match of the show, but of course we started off with the tag team title match, which was... changed very quickly before after the first commercial break, and it sucks to see... A guy like Bobby Fish, who last year, at the beginning of the year, tore his ACL and was out right up until we got to NXT TakeOver War Games. He was out. His tag team titles had to be not vacated, but eventually sent over to Roderick Strong, who joined the Undisputed Era last year. It was TakeOver WrestleMania weekend last year was kind of crazy because Adam Cole won the North American Championship, the first ever North American Champion. Then... He had to help defend the tag team titles in a triple threat match against the AOP and Bob and Roderick Strong and the P and Pete Dunn. Roderick Strong to a heel, so and joined the Undisputed Era, and that gave us the tag team title reign of Bobby of Roderick Strong and Kyle Valley, the first one. They did lose the titles and got them back, which is where Kyle Valley became the first man to hold, and that was that was the second reign of where. Kyle O'Reilly became the first man eventually to hold all the, cha- the tag team titles three times. But in this match, Keith Lee picks him up, picks up Bobby Fish, deadlifts him, and tosses him to Kyle O'Reilly, who was supposed to catch him, catch his fall. Unfortunately, something happens to where it doesn't go as planned. Bobby Fish's head hits the ground. Anybody says it was anything but his head hitting the mat, you are out of your mind. He hit the mat with his head. Well, not the mat, but the floor with his head, causing him to have a mild concussion. So, during the commercial break, which was picture in picture, I, the camera crew did a hell of a job keeping this a secret for the majority of the time. But by the time we got to the end of the picture in picture, Roderick Strong tagged in to take over this tag team match. It, they did say that William Regal made it an order that Roderick Strong was to come out and help defend the tag team titles. Bobby Fish, I hope you get better, man. I don't want to see anybody being hurt. Anybody wants to know about the Marvin Allo's situation, go check out my NXT review from a couple days ago because I talked in length about that. But during the end of this match, which was fucking fantastic, even though it made Dijakovic look stupid, Adam Cole is running down to do something. But what he ends up doing is getting sent hurling into the crowd, into a, a stadium, a, a field of plants, as Keith Lee pounces this dude into oblivion and ends in for that. So you have you have that happen and then we have while that's going on, Dodger Copic just watching in the ring, just frozen by what his tag team partner did, 
Ilo, 1, 2, 3 in the Undisputed Era in the winning match. Not a good look on by Dajakovic or Keith Lee, who came into the, mat the ring way too late. Chopper and Balor for the first time was fantastic. Beginning of the match, of course, saw Matt, um, saw Adam Cole get involved because Matt, um, caused Chopper to lose to Finn Balor. So, how long that's gonna go on, I have no idea. But, after the match, Chopper's down, Chopper's out. Balor, well, Adam Cole came out, he had his championship. During this, this thing, Jessica Carr, who is former NXT referee Jessica Carr, because she's on SmackDown apparently now, she's in this match. The title, was going to be used by Finn Balor, but Lexi grabs the title. She doesn't throw it out of the ring. She just drops it. And eventually, Balor drops Tommaso Ciampa face, neck first, back, like back of the head and neck first, onto the title, which was inadvertent because the referee, unfortunately, did not take the title out of the ring like you're supposed to. You're supposed to just take the title and remove it. She just dropped it and went about, went about away for a minute. So, Balor, of course, Chompa kicks out of that. Referee finally gets the belt to take it out of the ring, and that's where Madame Cole hit and attacks. Balor gets the win, and that was that. Now, Finn Balor is in the ring. Adam Cole gets his title. They're both doing their own poses, you know, the Undisputed Era pose for um, Adam Cole. Balor's got finger guns. Adam Cole looks like he might have a new ally when he taps the shoulder of Finn Balor. Finn Balor with the overhead kick, knocking out the champion. Balor is not part of the Undisputed Era. Balor will not be part of the Undisputed Era. Balor is on his own, as he should be. Another thing from NXT that was really a big thing was what were they going to do with Dakota Kai? If you watch TakeOver, one of the best heel turns since Tommaso Ciampa's heel turn um, Dakota Kai destroyed Tegan Knox. How did they do it? How did, how did they bring... How did we see her on her first night a, a, after TakeOver? New music. New demeanor. Same bubbly looking color, um, attire. I mean, if you're going to have her come out with new ring gear, with ring gear on in wrestle, she needs to come out with, like, just dark, moody colors. She was just wearing the same thing she was wearing at TakeOver. He figured, oh, I was I had this gear made. I didn't really do anything other than kill my best friend. I'm going to go out there and use it against my other best friend, former best friend, Candice DeRay. And that's where we got that. She came out with Tegan Knox's knee brace, and she ended up using that against Candice DeRay. And, of course, Rhea Ripley kicked a chair out of her arm and made her go away. Rhea Ripley and, of course, um, Shayna Baszler are just moving even closer and closer to that title match everyone wants to see. Unfortunately, TakeOver will not have another TakeOver to Portland, so I don't want to see this match until we get to Portland. Can we figure out a way to keep Rhea Ripley and Shannon Baszler away from each other until we get to Portland? And SmackDown. Oh, SmackDown. Will the Karen Corbin, Roman Reigns feud ever end? You know what was nice about Corbin being on Raw and, and Reigns being on SmackDown when the Superstar Shakeup happened? We didn't need to see that. We didn't get to see this anymore. Corbin and Reigns was all we saw for the majority of the year last year. This year, from the beginning of the year, so we had the Superstar Shakeup. We pretty much had Corbin and Reigns with the Shield and the Three Man Land. Then you draft Corbin to SmackDown, it was like, oh, we have to see Chad Gable and Baron Corbin. No, we didn't think about the fact that Baron Corbin and Roman Reigns were on the same brand. So here we are again. Roman Reigns is a little bit of a delusion, talking about how NXT didn't get the job done when SmackDown did on Sunday night, even though NXT won all but two matches, all but three matches. They won four out of seven. And one was a battle royal, which I don't think anyone gave a fuck about. But they just won't ever let this end. I, I can't say much else about this entire feud, because this entire feud absolutely sucks. And then, another thing that happened on this show that was interesting. Three 
Not one, not two, but three returns. Seamus, in the way, like, here's the thing. Seamus is making his return. He hasn't, he hasn't officially come back in the ring, but he's, come, he's coming back to SmackDown. But there is a little bit of a, like, a little bit of a change to him. He doesn't have the hawk anymore. He grew his hair out completely. He is back to what Seamus was before he came back from a previous injury and came back with the with the mohawk and the um, the braided beard. He looks like Seamus back before all of that. Second return was Alexa Bliss. We have not seen Alexa Bliss since the draft happened, and she was drafted. She was traded with Nikki Cross to SmackDown. There was a post-show interview between with Alexa Bliss and Nikki Cross, and Nikki Cross, oh Nikki Cross, I never want to hear this woman say she's a sex part again. That just was, just just go watch that and see the look on Alexa Bliss's face as she's trying not to bust up laughing when her when Nikki Cross is like, I'm a sex part. It, it, it's just so it, it's just so bad. I know last week or the week before that, I praised the revival for a promo they did on and on SmackDown post show, which these things are sometimes hit and miss. This was a big time miss for sure, but that wasn't it. That wasn't it. Elias has made his return as well. He returned. I believe he's had an ankle injury, maybe broke his ankle or something a couple months ago, but. Drake Maverick was being a real creeper to Dana Brooke, and <coughs> excuse me, Dana Brooke got Dana Brooke was being creeped on, and Elias came back and tore Drake Maverick a new one in a song while Dana Brooke just sat there and danced along to it. So we had three big returns to uh, to SmackDown: Elias, Alexa Bliss. And Sheamus in an imminent return. It's kind of funny because you have Cesaro and Sheamus on the same brand. But you won't bring back the bar. Why would you bring, why would you break up the bar only to eventually put Cesaro in another tag team with another foreign heel? Why can't we just have Sheamus and Cesaro as the tag team that they were? They were fantastic. They could do Wonders with the team of the New Day, with the Heavy Machinery team, with anybody that you want to put them up against. But no, we instead we get Nakamura and Cesaro. I hate to say it, but the Sheamus return just isn't going to work for me, the way they're going to do it. They're going to try and push this dude as a single star again. What happened the last time Sheamus was a single star? He, we went from Roman Reigns being the tag team, the World Heavyweight Champion at Survivor Series in 2015 to Sheamus being the World Heavyweight Champion coming out of Survivor Series 2015 and the ratings and everything just being absolutely atrocious. So, yeah, we get Sheamus again trying to be a single star again. I just don't see it happening. And The Fiend. Oh boy, The Fiend. Wants to play again with Daniel Bryan. The Fiend showed off a, in Flashes, a Universal Championship that looks like him. It's his, it's the mask on a plate. It says, let's me in. Let's, uh, hurt, it says, hurt, heal, hurt, heal on the sides. On the, um, on the front, on the sides of it. And it says, let's in, which me is probably where his face would be. Now, that is only for the Fiend, but when we see Dan, when we see Bray Wyatt himself, it's going to be the Universal title as it is, the big blue belt. So, I think this is the first time ever in WWE history that the Universal title, a world title, will be represented by two, by the, by two belts at the same time, and they're not unified, they're not two unified belts. It's like, for, an, for like alternate characters. That would be like if Mankind won the WWE Championship back in the day. And he came out as Dude Love, but Dude Love had a hippie-inspired WWF Championship belt. Or Cactus Jack came out with it, and he had a hardcore-style um, style, um, championship belt. So, what are they going to do with The Fiend? What are they going to do with Daniel Bryan? 
It looks like we're going down this route. At the end of the night, Daniel Bryan was in the ring. The Fiend pulled him down to hell. And it looked like he started tearing Daniel Bryan's hair out. Is Daniel Bryan going to be shaving his head? I hope the hell not. You sick bastards. That will be something we'll have to look forward to for sure. Daniel Bryan getting his hair ripped out by the Fiend until the laugh happened. And that's how SmackDown ended. Mm, and SmackDown was not, like, Raw was not a terrible show this week. I'm going to just say this is probably one of the better weeks overall for everything. Raw was not a terrible show. SmackDown wasn't a terrible show. NAD and AEW and NXT were not bad shows. The only bad show for wrestling this week, in my opinion, was NWA Power. NWA Power gave you a pedestrian show at best because they're trying to still edit out as much as they can of Jim Cornette because of the starvation slash racist joke that he did last week, which if he changes one or two words, the entire thing doesn't happen and it's not considered racist at all. But that is your Raw, your SmackDown, your AEW, your NXT, and everything in between. Let's talk a little bit of news here before we get out of here, and you guys are going to have yourself a wonderful day. We're going to talk a little bit about the Raw ratings and the SmackDown ratings because AEW's and NXT ratings will not be out until Monday. Raw ratings drew its weakest viewership of 2019 so far, with the Red Band attracting a 2.850. That's how we wrong. No, that's actually right. 2.0858, right? Now, this got to be wrong. Oh, yeah, I got the wrong one. No, Smack, like, Monday Night Raw drew a 2.1 something. It's actually not a good um, rating. 2.058, I got the wrong one. I got, like, two weeks ago. But, yeah, two, Smack, like, Raw's viewership is actually down coming out of Survivor Series, but not by much. Not by match. It was a 2.133 this week. It was a 2.135 the week before that. So, Monday Night Raw is just starting. It's, it, this is the time of the year. People need to realize this. Ratings are going to be down from here to the rest of the year. But I don't expect a ratings jump at all for Raw or SmackDown the rest of the year. Simply because Raw... Is going, like because we're going into the holiday, and this is also the slump. Every single year, last year was awful. Last year was so goddamn bad with the entire rating slump. We had Constable Corbin, wasn't that last year? Yeah, Constable Corbin, and WWE putting pretty much blaming him for the ratings drop, even though they're putting him in the main event every single week. It was just so bad back then. Now, yes, like I said, this week's Raw was not a bad show. It wasn't the best show. It wasn't the worst show at all. But it wasn't more than a 2.1 for sure. 2.135 or 2.133. It wasn't that good of a show, a, a, a good of a rating. And you expect that. Now, with the big four pay-per-views out of the way for this year, I don't expect Monday Night Raw to get much better with the rating. It would not surprise me coming into the end of December that... Raw's ratings will be averaging about averaging about 2.0 to 2 to 1.95. So So SmackDown though, we do have the prelims for SmackDown this week. I waited for hours. Trying to get this taping, the um, SmackDown prelims on Friday, on, on Saturday afternoon, because I tape on Saturday night this entire thing. And they were not showing up until Sunday for some reason last week. I don't know what the delay was for. But SmackDown's episode drew a 2.336 million viewers in the overnight rating, according to the show Buzz Daily. Hour 1 drew a 2.350 million viewers, then the second hour dropped 1.2 to 2.322. SmackDown also drew a .7 rating in the 18-49 demo, which is tied one for overnight with Frosty the Snowman. You're not beating Frosty. I'm sorry. You ain't beating Frosty the Snowman for anything. Frosty the Snowman is a legend. 
This is down 8.2% from last Friday's episode, which drew an average of 2.544 million viewers with the 0.8 rating in the 18 to 49 demo. So SmackDown, yes, is going to be down. Now, this is, of course, the overnight. Last time we had an overnight on here, the, the overnight rating was actually up higher than the overall rating. So, when we get to Monday, which is tomorrow, or Tuesday, I'm sorry, the rating won't be up till Tuesday. When we get to Tuesday for SmackDown's rating, it could be 2.336, it could be 2.4, it could be 2.2.1, or 2.211, we don't know. But usually what it seemed like is that we would have an a, a overnight of 2.336, and then the next, on Tuesday, the rating will be 2.30. 2.300. So it's going to be interesting to see what happens with the money, with the SmackDown, with the raw, with the SmackDown rating coming out of Tuesday. Uh, when it comes to looking at ratings for for wrestling, the holidays is the worst time of the year because they always get jumbled around and delayed. Now we do know that AEW will not have a show on Christmas because of It's a Wonderful Life is everywhere on US on TNT, TBS, and everywhere else. Why they have to have a marathon of that show, uh, that uh, that terrible movie, is beyond me. Yes, I call it It's a Wonderful Life, a terrible movie. Come, fight me. But, SmackDown ratings will continue to fall. My biggest thing about SmackDown ratings is, if they don't get the show to be any better than it is right now, when those, Smack, when those ratings fall lower than Monday Night Raw, I don't think they're going to get them back, ever. So, we'll have to wait and see what happens with SmackDown. Let's talk about The Fiend. The Fiend. Since capturing captain the Universal Championship for Seth Rollins at Crown Jewel, The Fiend Bray Wyatt has locked in a rivalry with former leader of the Yes Movement, Daniel Bryan. However, this rivalry, according to the backstage sources in WWE, Very Wrestling and News Co., is very much a placeholder to in the run-up to WrestleMania 36. Then Wyatt is expected to go one-on-one -on -one with the big dog, Roman Reigns. Of course, this is just a placeholder. This is not going to be your feud going into WrestleMania. Honestly, anything that you see in a feud right now, outside of maybe because it's only small planted seeds, Bailey and Sasha Banks, which better be the fucking women's championship for SmackDown at WrestleMania. If they get cold feet now, they have lost their damn mind. But anything that you see now, you're not going to be seeing at WrestleMania. At least I hope we don't see Baron Corbin versus Roman Reigns somewhere down the line. I think we need to end that feud. However, this, um, Vince McMahon still sees Roman as the as the face of the company, and backstage decision makers believe it has been long enough since he was the top of the card. They also doubt he will experience the same fan backlash which has plagued his former title reigns. <coughs> yeah, I don't think you. I don't think they understand how wrestling fans work. Do you not see what people were doing when the Fiend was getting stomped four, five, six, seven, eight times between Hell in a Cell and Crown Jewel? The booze that Seth Rollins was getting. If he gets hit with one spear, and that is that, and he wins the match, and he loses the match to one spear, do you know what that's going to do to the Fiend? And you know what that's going to do to Roman? You have killed two acts like that. Does the does Roman Reigns need to be Universal Champion? No. Is he the guy? No. Is there a the guy in the company right now? No. Is there going to be a, the guy in the company? No. Look at Seth Rollins. Seth Rollins has been the face of Monday Night Raw. When you watch your opening video packages, Raw and SmackDown, who are the last two superstars that you see? You see Seth Rollins on Raw and Roman on SmackDown. Those are your two top guys in this company. Now, yes, and I've said it before, other people have said it too. Roman has, held, has, has been the top guy, has been better as the top guy since, since, like, since he became, since he's been the top guy, he's held, he's handled being the top guy way better than Seth Rollins has ever been able to. Since Seth Rollins won the Universal Title earlier this year, he has had a feud with Will Ospreay over who was a better, uh, who was the best professional wrestler, has shit on the fans multiple times, has called AEW the minor leagues, has. Pretty much just cracked every which way. As started a Twitter feud with, uh, who was that? It was he had a Twitter feud with somebody else, 
and just keeps like what you see on Monday Night Raw this past Monday in the opening segment was pretty much Seth Rollins on t- on Twitter and on social media. The guy has been going after CM Punk. Has been trying to start a feud with CM Punk, which, by the way, Vince McMahon was not happy. Was not happy about that. Was not happy with the fact that he has continuously tried to book a. He's like Vince McMahon has had this thing. Like when Hulk Hogan came out, I think it was 2005. Doing a reunion show or something. They were, they were doing some kind of nostalgia show. And Hulk Hogan came out. And Gene Oakland asked him. Who do you see when you come out of that curtain? Who do you see facing next? Hulk Hogan. Said that Texas Rattlesnake Stone Cold Steve Austin. Stone Cold knew nothing about this. Vince McMahon knew nothing about this. Vince McMahon was not happy. Because Vince McMahon does not. Like having. Superstars tease matches that he cannot book. So, Seth Rollins is going out there and being a coward and talking trash to CM Punk, who is doing his job and answering a question on a show that he is contracted to. It's just absolutely stupid. And another thing of him just is descent into irrelevancy. So... Yes, Roman Reigns might not get as much backlash as before, but yes, as you heard on, on Friday, he was getting some boos. He was. The boos are not all dissipated. There's a lot more cheers because, and it's, and it's nothing WWE did. It's the fact that Seth Rollins has become everything we didn't want him to be. He is a whiny, he is a whiny, condescending prick. Just like, just like Kevin Owens said on Monday, he is trying to be what the company wants him, needs him to be instead of trying to be himself. And he's become an absolute prick. And the fans have caught on to that. And the fans do not like Seth Rollins. And Seth Rollins, who used to be the hottest babyface in the company, is one of the most hated guys in the company. Now, unfortunately, if you bring Roman Reigns up against The Fiend at WrestleMania, and you have The Fiend eating one spear after he went to Daniel Bryan and Seth Rollins on multiple occasions, taking everything that they have only to eat a fucking spear from Roman Reigns, you will piss off the entire WWE Universe to no end. And then The Fiend, I'm still saying it, by this time next year, The Fiend is going to be an irrelevant act on the com- on WWE television. Why do I say that? Just look at WWE's track record. I'm surprised The Fiend hasn't been destroyed already. Just look at him, but the look at Buddy Murphy, look at Mustafa Ali, look at Cedric Alexander, Anytime somebody gets a little taste of the spotlight, they get destroyed by WWE and Vince McMahon because Vince McMahon is a fucking idiot. If your not, name is not Roman Reigns or Seth Rollins, they don't give a fuck about you. Look at Drew McIntyre. This guy has champion written all over him. What have they done with Drew McIntyre since he's been on the main roster? They stuck him with Dolph Ziggler. Yes, they won the tag team titles. They stuck him with Dolph Ziggler and Braun Strowman. They stuck him with Bobby Lashley and Baron Corbin. It, it's just give this guy a championship and get this guy out there. It is just high time that this motherfucker went out there and got what he deserved. And that is a title run. This guy should be going up against Brock Lesnar at WrestleMania. This guy, Drew McIntyre, should be the face of Monday Night Raw, but for whatever reason, they don't give him the shot that he deserves. So, to anyone who thinks that The Fiend is going to be just as hot and just as over a year from now, give me a fucking break. And again, when they get to WrestleMania, if it's The Fiend versus Roman, which honestly, I figured they would go with Roman Reigns versus Brock Lesnar, and this is before Brock Lesnar, of course, got, got went back to Monday Night Raw, but... If it's The Fiend versus Roman at WrestleMania in the main events, Roman's going... And and this is another thing. Roman's MO and how he does his matches doesn't doesn't match up to The Fiend. The Fiend is the one who usually takes a licking and just keeps coming back and coming back and coming back. Roman doesn't do that. Roman's the one who takes the licking, gets his ass kicked, and eventually makes his heroic comeback. So how are you going to make The Fiend... 
how the hell are you going to make the fiend and Roman reigns switch themselves up to where the fiend is beating the hell out of the Roman just for Roman to make his heroic comeback? Superman punch, Superman punch, Superman punch, spear, one, two, three. I guarantee you it's going to be Superman punch, Superman punch, Miss spear, Superman punch, spear, one, two, three. I guarantee you it's one spear and that's it. Now, yes, if there's a lot of things that can happen between now and then, but we also, this is also the company that from WrestleMania 33 to WrestleMania 34 had Roman Reigns versus Brock Lesnar not penciled in, they had that motherfucker re- written in pen already. Before, before the uh, WrestleMania 33 was over, they had the card for WrestleMania 34 already set out, and in the main event slot, they had Roman Reigns versus Brock Lesnar, WWE champ- uh, Universal Championship, all fucking ready. So for people to say that, oh, they don't have that already paid, bullshit. It's already been decided, and unless something happens to Roman or The Fiend, we're getting Roman Reigns versus The Fiend at WrestleMania next year, and the Roman Reign, the Roman Empire is going to be up and walking again, running again to an extent to where people are going to hate him by the end of the year. The only reason, and this is what's fucking stupid, is that the only reason a lot of people don't boo Roman Reigns is because they don't want to. And the, and the reason they don't want to is because... Oh, we don't want to boo a guy who beat leukemia. Who gives a shit? Joe beat leukemia. Roman didn't beat leukemia. Joe did. If you can't if you can't look past the man who beat leukemia to look at the character of Roman Reigns, I don't know what the fuck to tell you. Now, the next thing we're going to talk about here in a second makes me wonder why they would even go with what they're going to do. But, yeah, we'll talk about that in a second. But, yes. If you have a problem with Bill, with not like, what culture went to WrestleMania this year? And they went to the Raw after WrestleMania. Rowan, of course, was on Raw that week, that night. And they felt pissed off because they, they felt pissed. They, they were like pissed or mad because there were people in the building booing Roman out of the building. And I'm like, why are you getting upset at people hate you hating on this guy? If they want to boo the guy, they can. Who cares if Joe beat leukemia? That is not the person people are booing. Nobody is booing Joe. People are booing Roman Reigns. There are two different things. Joe is his real is who is his um, shoot name, while Roman is the character he plays on television, or he plays at a live event, or he plays when he's up, when the cameras are on. If you boo the man, if you want to boo the man while he's in the ring, then more power to you. If you want to say that he's a weak piece of shit or something because he went out and battled leukemia, that's a different story. There are two different factors to this. If you want to boo Roman Reigns, go right to head. There is no problem with booing Roman. If you just feel like you're obligated to cheer the guy because this guy beat leukemia, I have to cheer him. No, you do not. No, you don't. Because again, Roman Reigns was not out there beat, battling leukemia. Joe Onawaye was battling leukemia. That would, just, that would just be like saying, um, huh, let me think here. That would just be like saying, um, Mark Harmon, who plays, um, Gibbs on the, on NCIS. That would be like saying if Mark Harmon went out and got, and say you hate the character Mark, um, Gibbs. Maybe you hate that character on NCIS. Maybe you think he... He, he's too stern or whatever, that you have a problem with that character. But the guy behind him was in a bad accident and, like, was fighting for his life and came out of it and on the other side better than he was beforehand. Are you all of a sudden going to love the character that he plays on TV? No. Because if he goes out there and he plays the same exact character he's played on TV before his accident, what's the fucking point? Like, why are you going to sit there and... Call, why the hell are you going to sit there and be like all happy for this character? Why are you, you're not going to go and watch NCIS if you're somebody who's a fan of NCIS but you don't like Mark Harmon, as a, like Mark Harmon's character, because oh well, I have like I feel obligated to um, like this character now because his because the guy who plays him got hurt. No, no. That just be also like let's say you're a. Um, Let's just say um, you're a football fan and you're a fan of a, of a team and 
your team and you're going up against your rivals. That'd be like saying you're going up, say you're the you're you're a fan of Ohio State and you're going up against your rival team of Michigan. Now, six weeks before this, one of the one of the major team one of the main one of the team captains went out with a major injury and was gonna be out for up until up until like was gonna be out for this game. Are you going to be cheering for Michigan or the yeah? You're going to be cheering for the Michigan team because oh, they're playing in the mem- of, of to they're playing in the good spirits of their teammate. No, you're going to boo that team and hate that team no matter what. So why the fuck do people feel like they have to be obligated to cheer for a guy just because? Uh, for why do they okay? Why do they have to be feel like they have to be obligated to cheer for a guy? Because uh, on TV, a TV character, because the guy portraying him got sick. Give me a fucking break. It just pisses me off when people sit there and it's like, well, nobody should be booing Roman Reigns because he had he battled leukemia. No, he didn't. Roman Reigns had nothing to do with battling leukemia. Did he not come out on that episode of Monday Night Raw when he came out in jeans, a t-shirt, and a gold chain, and say, my name is Joe, and I've been living with leukemia for the last, for like the last 11 years. He didn't say, I'm Roman Reigns and I have leukemia. He said, my name is Joe. So, as soon as he said, my name is Joe, the Roman Reigns character is gone. He's not Roman Reigns. He wasn't Roman Reigns until he came back a week after he said, I'm in remission. He wasn't Roman Reigns the entire time. When he was off doing... Um, doing that, the um, Hobbs and Shaw movie. That wasn't Roman Reigns. That was Joe. When he was off doing it, I think he did a show for Nickelodeon. That wasn't Roman Reigns. That was Joe. So anybody who thinks that, oh well, this guy survived cancer, so yeah, and, and like I hated him beforehand. Just like there are fucking people out there saying that, oh, you must feel like shit because you shit on this guy so much. Before you found, and, and how how's it feel that you uh, made fun of a cancer patient, a cancer survivor? And I'm like, none of us knew for a fucking reason. None of us knew until that night in October that he came out on Monday Night Raw and told us, "Hey, I have leukemia." So anybody who sits there and wants to shit on anybody who made who said that needs to go fuck themselves. Where am I getting with this? Basically, when we get to WrestleMania, if people, if Roman Reigns. It's the fiend by one spear. I don't want to hear 40, 50,000 people cheering Roman's name for a bullshit, for, uh, bullshit finish and a bullshit booking decision. If we go out there and Roman Reigns beats, beats the fiend with one spear, I expect to hear a fucking fan backlash that they haven't heard since Roman Reigns went out with leukemia. Plain and simple. If Roman wins the champion, if, if, if they go out there and you have a hard fought match and Roman ha- it takes like four or five spears or six spears or seven spears to take down the Fiend, that's fine. But if Roman Reigns wins the WWE Universal Championship with one spear at WrestleMania uh, in April, if people were cheering this shit, then this company is fucking lost. Speaking of the Fiend, as we continue on here. Who is the top merch seller in WWE? Well, it happens to be The Fiend. He is moving a lot of merchandise. Why is now the number one merchandise seller for the company according to the Wrestling Observer Newsletter? WWE Shot is currently offering more than 20 tight items for the Wyatt and his Fiend Firefly Funhouse. On a related note, the shop recently started selling the Wyatt Head Lantern, which if you watched the match at Survivor Series, you could see the fucking Head Lantern. It was so... And it pisses me off because they have a picture of this thing. And it's the head lantern. But the light coming out of the lantern is blue. Somebody, some sports schlub at Survivor Series had this lantern and kept raising it up. So when they're using the red lighting, it is an eyesore as hell to see this fucking lantern popping out. God, is it annoying when you've seen that. And you're like watching this match. You're watching Daniel Bryan and The Fiend face each other. And... First off, that red lighting needs to go. People are pointing out to you, The Undertaker didn't need red lighting or lighting to make his matches any more lighting. You just needed The Fiend to be The Fiend. The red lighting does not need to be there. But anyway, 
When you're sitting there watching this match, and every so often you're seeing this blue light continue to pop up, because some dumbass game is like, Hey look, I got the wire lantern, I got the wire lantern, here you go, you wanna look at it, here you go. It's like, dude, put the fucker away, because I'm sitting here trying to watch this match as best as I can, and your fucking blue light is not helping. The, 100, the lantern is $100. Sold out fast. But apparently it had been restocked. The lanterns are also being sold at live events, merchandise stands. So, yeah. Bray Wyatt is your top seller. Of course, that probably eats Vince McMahon alive because he wants his boy, Roman Reigns, to be the top seller. But, um, but of course, The Fiend is very popular right now. He will be popular until Vince McMahon makes another boneheaded decision like they did at Hell in a Cell. Now, speaking of Vince McMahon, he said to be very disappointed at the main event of Survivor Series. Really? Why wouldn't I? You really, you really expected it to be any other way? Because that match, Becky Lynch has been in two triple threat matches, the main event, a big four pay-per-view, and both have been underwhelming. That's sad. Um, via WrestleVerse, WWE Chairman reportedly felt like the 2019 Survivor Series pay-per-view main event was a major disappointment. The show ended with NXT Women's Champion Shayna Baszler winning the non-title triple threat match over Wild Women's Champion Becky Lynch and SmackDown Women's Champion Bayley, which made, the night, which made NXT win the night with a four, four wins over one for Raw and two for SmackDown. In an update, the Wrestling Observer Newsletter reports that the awkward spot in the main event came as a surprise, because the match was heavily worked on and practiced ahead of time, the match got so bad that Vince was said to be really mad about it as it was happening. There was a rumor going around that Vince was so mad during the match that he was telling the referee high spots for the talent to do. But sources in WWE have only told the observer that McMahon was mad, but had every right to be. They denied the story about him sending high spots to the referee as the match was going on. Regarding Shayna Baszler, though, her push was the idea behind the match and really the entire angle. The original plan was for Baszler was to have her, uh, her on the main roster in 2020, but there's no word yet if that is still the plan. Plain and simple, as soon as Shayna Baszler loses that championship and she needs to be losing it to Rhea Ripley whenever they do the match, even though I wish it was at Portland, I don't think it's going to make it to Portland, but when those ha two have a women's championship match, Rhea Ripley needs to win the championship. It's time for somebody else to be women's champion. Now, like, I, like when Oscar was women's champion, it did like having an undefeated, a, a, a badass who holds the title for a very long time in NXT for the women's division. They have a strong women's division, but having one person hold that championship for as long as Shayna Baszler has is not a good thing. For the simple fact is, you run through everybody, and then when you have nobody left to go, what happens? Who was going to be there? They had to bring Rhea Ripley from NXT UK just to get her, just to get somebody to face Shayna Baszler because they had nobody else. I am a little disappointed that Tony Storm was not on NXT this week. I wish they would have had her at least make her NXT return or debut because she was at Survivor Series and there was no follow up to that. She was on NXT UK this week. I don't really watch it, but it was a gif on. There was a couple picture videos or gifs on it. On you on their you on their Twitter page, so get Tony Storm to NXT if you're going to use that Survivor Series for crying out loud. Now, Baszler on the main roster makes all the sense in the world. She really has nothing left to do but to drop that championship. She has nothing left to do. She is a part of the first ever women's war games match. She's a two-time women's champion. She's held the title for over 500 days combined with her first and second reign. What else can she do? Nothing. She needs to drop the title and go on to do hopefully bigger and better things because she is Ronda Rousey's, one of Ronda Rousey's best friends. And honestly, I think she has a chance to do something because she is a friend of Ronda Rousey. And the last thing WWE wants to do is piss Ronda Rousey off to where she isn't going to come back because it's like, well, look what you did to my friend Shayna. Why would I want to come back if you're, doing, if you're disrespecting my friend like that? So WWE is probably going to give Shayna Baszler a rub. And honestly, either Bailey or Specky Lynch need Shayna Baszler to feud with. Because I, honestly, I think it would be Bailey, but that would mean Sha um, Shayna Baszler would need to be babyface. And I guess we could have Sasha Bang, I mean, Becky Lynch take on Shayna Baszler. That'd be fine. Because apparently Charlotte's going on her own against... I was seeing an Oscar on Monday, which makes no fucking sense in the world, so I don't know what they're doing there. But yeah. 
let's uh, let's talk a little AEW because I only have what I have is the top ten for the men and the women and the tag team division. As you know, they do this thing every single week, which honestly I think should be a monthly ranking and not a weekly ranking because not much moving will happen in a week. But the men are as follows: number five. MJF with a 2-1 singles record, 3-1 overall, and last week he wasn't ranked. Tony Rhodes, who shouldn't even be allowed to be on the rankings because he can't challenge for the world title, and you, you should be using these rankings to see who is going to be the number one contender to your championship. What the hell are you going to do if Cody Rhodes was to go on a big winning streak and be the number one contender when he can't challenge for the championship? 4-1-1 in singles, 5-2-1 in overall. He was number 3 last week. Kenny Omega jumps up after beating Pac to number 3. 4-2 overall in the singles, 7-4 overall, and he was number 5 last week. Pac drops, of course, after getting beat by Kenny Omega to second with 4-2-1 singles and a 4-3-1 overall. Meaning, John Moxley, who is 3-0-1 in the singles competition and 3-1-1 overall, is your number 1 contender. And this is just right. As you saw on AEW's TV show this week, John Moxley made his presence known to Chris Jericho. If you really want to have another, um, to have your second champion of this company, John Moxley needs to be that guy. John Moxley needs to be the guy to beat Chris Jericho, whether that's at the next pay per view or during an, a, a, a TV show, a TV taping. Or I don't know. John Moxley needs to be your next champion. So him being under like John Moxley, who has not been pinned in AEW, not in a lights out match, not in a tag team match, not in a singles match, as he's three zero and one in singles. He hasn't been pinned in AEW. He's the only person with a sustainable record to not be pinned in AEW or made submitted. So John Moxley needs to go on this big winning streak and become the number become the AEW champion. Now the women, number five, beat Priestley after winning a tag team match with uh, Amy Sakurai last week, who's one and two in singles and three and two overall. Nana Rose, who is two and three in the singles and three and three overall, and Britt Baker, who is three three and two in singles and six and three overall. Amy Sakura who is 1-1 one one in singles and 3-3 three and three overall, which I still don't get why she was even... I, when they had full gear and they made her the number one contender, that still made absolutely no sense. But number one, who should be your next women's champion, is Hakura Shida. 3-1 singles, 4-2 overall. I'm, I'm just going to say it again. Riho needs to lose that championship ASAP. She has no business being a champion. I know why she's champion. I don't like the fact that they gave her the championship just because she's Kenny Omega's favorite. It's been well documented that Kenny Omega, like, if he had, like, his favorite um, mixed tag team partner is Riho. I don't give a flying fuck. Riho has no business being your women's champion. She is not, the, she is not good. Like, I don't care who she is. I don't care who she's going up against. Riho should not be your women's champion, period. And then, of course, your tag team division. Pride and Powerful hit the number one ranking after being fourth last week. Santana and Ortiz are three and one in tag teams and four and one overall. The Young Bucks at number two with the tag team record of four and three. And Nick is seven and five overall, while Matt is six and seven and four overall, as he as Nick took on Matt Jackson. I'm not Matt Jackson, but he took on Phoenix last uh, last week. Bref, best friends with Trent being four and three in tag team and six and five overall, while Chuck Taylor is four and three in tag team and five and four overall. The Lucha Bros dropped majorly, with Pentagon being four and four overall and six five and six over, um, four and four in tag teams and six and five, five and six overall, while Phoenix is four and four in tag teams and six and five overall, which is kind of weird. How the best friends who had who beat the Lucha Bros on Wednesday ended up dropping dropping the uh, Lucha Bros so far down in the rankings. And then number five is Private Party with Isaiah Cassidy and Mark Quinn, four and four overall. I mean, and tag teams in four and six overall. 
Now, the number one contenders for all three titles are absolutely who I think they should be. Pride and Powerful should be the ones to take the titles off of STU. That would be a hell of a way for them to go. Maybe you could have Chris, maybe you could have Pentagon screw the um, STU out of the tag team titles with Pentagon attacking Christopher Daniels, who would be at ringside for this match, allowing Jake Hager, who would probably be at ringside for Pride and Powerful, to take out either Scorpio Sky or um, or, uh, Frankie Kazarian, causing Pound and Powerful to win the tag team titles and making the inner circle that much more powerful. And again, Hakura Shida should be your number one, should be your women's champion ASAP. Riho's time as champion has already come and gone. It needs to end. It's just them wasting buying time because they don't really have anybody else other than Shida and if they would get B. Priestley some time, B. Priestley would be a hell of a person to be in this women's division. Unfortunately, she works more for, sh- for stardom than she does AEW. So that is why they don't really give her as much time as they probably should. That is all of our news for Unscripted this week. One more final thought here. If you, like I said, if you haven't seen my, uh, my NXT review, I went into full length on the entire Mario Ronaldo and Corey Graves story with Marvin, with Corey Graves giving you one of the biggest, fakest apologies I have ever seen on his After the Bell podcast. Just go listen to his After the Bell for the first few minutes when he makes this apology. This apology, he sounds so fake, so insincere, like it was something he was told he had to do. He didn't want to do it because he didn't think he did any wrong. Just like Jim Cornette Last week for the NWA Power feels like he didn't do anything wrong. Honestly, Corey Graves feels like it honestly felt like he just was doing this out of WWE's telling him he had to. So that is all we gotta say about that. So go check that out. Monday Night Raw is going to of course have Charlotte versus Oscar and Kyrie Saint in a two on one handicap match. Why? I don't know. Starcade is happening tonight. I am not watching it. I'm not reviewing it. It means absolutely nothing. The only thing coming out of Starcade tonight is Bobby Lashley versus Rusev in a false count in a last man standing match, or I think it was a last man standing match. Which hopefully will be the end of this fucking feud and we can move on to other things for Bobby Lashley or Rusev. And the women's tag team titles will be on the line in a fatal four way as two members of as the four horse women was we split up into the boss and hug connection, the T the um what the hell would be a tag team for the other two? Um Becky Lynch and Charlotte Flair and of course Alexa Bliss and Nikki Cross, all three of them in a four to four way with the tag team champions, and that was the only matches that I heard that they had, along with Kevin Owens show with Rick Flair. Do you care? Because I don't and I don't think anyone should. It's Starcade. WWE has made a mockery of this pay-per-view, this once hallowed pay-per-view, by making it a one-hour house show on the WWE Network. Honestly, Starcade should be the December pay-per-view, but instead they want to give you an hour of a house show and call it Starcade. It's absolutely stupid. But that is all I'm going to be talking about here. I'll see you guys Tuesday for Monday Night Raw Review. Thursday for NXT, um, for AEW, Wednesday, Friday for a- NXT, and Saturday for SmackDown, and Sunday again for Unscripted number 98. Until then, my name is Franz. Hit that subscribe button, comment down below, like or dislike this video, find me on Twitter at the Franz Club, find me on twitch.tv slash the Franz Club, and I'll see you guys later. Make sure to go check out the Franz players. I'm playing through the Red War campaign on Destiny 2. At the front at twitch youtube.com slash the France plays. Until then, my name is France and I'll see you guys later.